All right, I'm gonna do something a little bit different tonight. I am, uh, you can tell by the background that I'm in a different place. I'm actually in my son-in-law's house. He is at the hospital with my daughter. They are about to bring a little one into this world. We're probably talking maybe a few hours away, maybe a few minutes. And I'm here house sitting, if you will, because we have a couple of dogs. I'm looking after my dog and also uh, Cooper and Chas's dog as well. Cash, what a great name. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just waiting here for the good news. And then uh, we'll see if my wife is going to come home after the baby is born or come to the house. Because we're going to stay here for a couple of days. But I thought... Um, It'd be kind of interesting to do something a little bit different. My wife actually <clears throat> <clears throat> packed my bags for me while I was at work in Calgary. We live in Cochrane. She packed my bags for me because we weren't sure if we we're going to stay uh, overnight, one night or two nights. So she packed my bag and I asked her, I said, did you perchance pack my Bible? And she said, no, sorry, I forgot. Probably had the baby on her mind. Don't blame her for that. So I went out and purchased a new King James Bible. Not a new King James version, but a new King James version. This is exactly the same Bible as what I have at home. The one that I highlight all the time. So instead... I'm going to use this Bible as my backup. You might be thinking, well, why didn't you just use your app on your phone? There's something about having a physical copy, hard copy of the Bible to read through. And I'm actually right now in the book of Jeremiah. So I thought this would be kind of fun to see how quick I can actually get through the entire Bible. I don't know how far I'll get. But I want to share some of my favorite scriptures uh, in the Bible. And uh, we'll see how long this video is. If you like this kind of thing, this is uh, basically a, uh, a trip down memory lane. So I'm going to open up the Bible. We're going to start in Genesis. And I'm just going to cruise through. And if there's a verse that, or a scripture that jumps out to me, then I'll just share my thoughts on that. Uh, but keeping in mind, this is brand new. I don't have, uh, I haven't highlighted anything in this book yet. And you'll notice that there's no commentary. And this is how I prefer to read my Bible these days. I don't like commentary because I feel like I'm reading two Bibles then. Because all of a sudden you have a book that's 1,100 pages, 1,000 pages, and you add a commentary to it. You're now reading a book. Uh, that's about 2,000 pages, and it's going to be very difficult for you to get through that Bible. I read this almost every single month. It takes me an average of 40 days or so to get through the Bible, only because I dive deep. Uh, for the past, I would say, three, four days, I've been reading the book of Nehemiah each day. It takes about 40 minutes or so to read the book of Nehemiah. So I also read Ezra a few times. I read Esther a few times because there's a lot of good nuggets in here. I actually created a 30-day devotional on it. But enough of that. Let's just dive right in and let's just uh, see what we come up with. All right, so Genesis. Let's just jump into one thing right out of the gate that I love, the King James Bible, is this uh, opening here. This is basically to the most high and mighty... Prince James, by the grace of God. So this is a dedication to King James, which is kind of cool. I like that. Every once in a while, I'll just read that for fun. All right, so Genesis. Another interesting note is there is no copyright for reading the King James Bible out loud. If you read the NIV version out loud, the New Living Translation out loud, the NSRV and all these other versions, once you get to like either 200 verses or 500 verses, uh, whether that's on your YouTube channel or whatever, you actually need to write 
into the company and ask for permission to be able to read the word of God out loud or to maybe you have a journal and you're writing, maybe you're doing an essay or whatever in Bible college or whatever it is. If, if half your work is consisting of those versions, you have to get permission. With the King James Bible, you don't need any permission. You could read this whole book in one sitting. That's also what I love about the King James Bible. So we're in the book of Genesis, chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I love the book of Genesis. I read it every single month. It takes me about three hours to read. If you spend two hours a day, you can get through the whole Bible. If you read other books and stuff, it's going to take you a little bit, obviously, a bit longer to get through the Bible. But if you can dedicate two hours a day, you can get through the Bible in 30 days. And I always love coming back to the book of Genesis. I think the book of Genesis, before I got into this, was probably a book that I read quite a bit. Uh, whether it took me a year to read the book of Genesis, whether it took me six months, whatever it is, I would always read the book of Genesis and then get derailed halfway through the book of uh, Exodus or Leviticus and then stop reading, basically. Anyways, so we got the six days of creation. Fascinating, then we get into the Garden of where the Garden of Eden, where we see Adam and Eve for the first time. God creates Adam and then creates Eve out of Adam. And quickly we get introduced to the serpent, that ancient serpent, the devil. And basically, from henceforward, we now see the fall of man. Man, because he took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now he knows how to do good things, and now he knows how to do evil things. That's what the knowledge of good and evil is. You now know how to do it. And in some way, my theory is that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was almost like a, uh, without getting crazy scientific or, or futuristic, whatever, it, it seems like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was almost a snapshot of what the future was going to hold for mankind. And God said, I don't want you to know what's coming down the pipes. I want to be able to basically teach you. Is my would be my understanding. I, I want I want you guys to do it the right way. I want you to come to me with any questions. And Eve was tempted with the idea that she could be potentially as wise as God, knowing good and evil. And that's how the devil tempted her. And then once that happened. God said they cannot now take of the tree of life because they will live forever. And they don't, they, you won't need God then because you're going to have all the knowledge, everything that, you're, that you want to do, good or bad, you don't need God anymore. And so God kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. And we see quickly that uh, the the future generations started building cities and all this kind of stuff, which is quite fascinating because again, I think it goes back to the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they understood now, at least a group of people, how to build cities, how to uh, handle livestock, all this kind of stuff. And then as time progresses, it feels like we're getting dumber and dumber in some ways. You know, like, oh, it's very difficult for people to sit down and just read for hours at a time. It's very difficult. Uh, our focus isn't always there. We, uh, we have a hard time paying attention to things for longer than a few minutes at a time. So I don't know what the next generation is going to be like with all the phones, with uh, all the apps that you have, all this kind of stuff chat gpt all this kind of thing and it's interesting that um for me personally i like going back to old school i like the physical 
uh, Bible. I like studying it. I like pouring into it. This is what I do the majority of my time outside of work is I am diving into this Bible, trying to understand it, trying to learn everything humanly possible about it and about God and about um, Christ's plan for our lives, not only today, but also in eternity. So that was just, that's just one thought right out of the gate with Genesis. So we'll just continue on because I'll, I'll never get this video done if, if I take too long on one verse of the Bible. But I could do this all day and all night. So anyways, we get to the flood. Genesis 5, where mankind is basically becoming wicked. And the only person that was righteous is Noah. So we get that. And then after the flood, after the flood, we now see men calling upon the name of the Lord. And eventually they get to a point where uh, they build the Tower of Babel and God comes down and sees what everyone is doing. And they're all of one voice, which is very similar to where we are at today. We're all one voice, whether that's using the English language, perhaps. Um, there is a debate out there as to what the original language was, because I believe that everyone spoke languages depending where they lived. But when they came together, they spoke one language, and that's how they're able to get lots of stuff done. Well, we see this today. People can get more things done if you learn English. English is probably the, one of the most popular languages around the world. If you want to do transactions anywhere in the world, you have to know English. So continuing on, we get introduced to Abraham. And God approaches him, brings him out of Ur of Chaldees. Which is kind of interesting because eventually that's where... Um, Judah, the tribes of Judah get carried away um, because Israel splits in half. Basically, 10 tribes go to Israel and eventually they get carried off to the by the Assyrians. And then the Babylonians come and carry the southern tribe. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's interesting that um, Abraham was basically called from way over in the Middle East, if you will eastern portions of um where would that be i guess basically babylon in that area which is kind of interesting so we get introduced to abraham get introduced to his wife god makes a promise to abraham that for as as much as you can count the stars that's going to be your descent. The same thing for the sand. As, as much as you can count for the sand. You're, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And Abraham believed God. Even though he was old. And this was accounted to him for righteousness. This was before the law. Before the covenants. Before the Ten Commandments. Before anything. Abraham believed. And that was credited to him for righteousness. And because of that, God told him to circumcise himself, his son, uh, Ishmael, and then any in his household that wanted to follow God and had the same belief as what Abraham had. So they were to circumcise themselves in order to remember that covenant that God had made. It's very similar to another covenant whenever it rains, as soon as the rain stops, you see a rainbow in the sky. That's that's a symbol of God's promise not to destroy the whole world by a flood. So that's a covenant that he had made with all of mankind. He's not going to wipe us out by a flood. Anyways, we get into the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Abraham. Let me just skip ahead here. <coughs> <coughs> Oh, we're all, we're all the way into Genesis chapter 20 plus. So let's go, let's go all the way to basically Joseph. One of my favorite stories is Joseph 
uh, Joseph's story is where basically they betray his brother, which is very interesting because later in life, later on in history, I should say, Jesus gets betrayed by Judah, which is kind of interesting. So Joseph ends up getting sold to the Ishmaelites. They take him to Egypt and he gets sold to Potiphar and basically ends up in prison. <clears throat> And eventually his brothers come there looking for food. And that's where they end up living for just over 400 years, 450 years. And that is the book of Genesis. Love, love reading the book of Genesis. Then we get into Exodus. We get introduced to Moses. And again, history would say that, um, scholars would say that, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is written by one person, which is Moses. And uh, I believe that. I think it's a fantastic study. Probably spent a little bit of time in Israel, or in Egypt, I should say, uh, accessing all the archives in Egypt because um, Moses was educated as an Egyptian for 40 years so you probably have a lot of access when pharaoh's your dad and uh so that's kind of interesting in itself when you think about it so we see moses ends up killing a guy hides him in the dirt probably very similar to what cain did to abel buried him in the dirt and the next day he saw two guys fighting and he wanted to break them up and saying, like, you guys shouldn't be fighting against each other. And the one guy said, who are you? Like, are you a judge over us? Are you going to kill me? Are you going to kill us like you did the guy yesterday? So I think that guy that said that was probably the guy that Moses was helping out the day before. Just a thought. So Moses thought, okay, everybody knows what I've done. Flees. Becomes a shepherd for 40 years. I'm going to skip ahead. Basically, God meets him in a burning bush and then tells him to go back to Egypt to bring his people to this mountain, which is, which is fascinating. So Moses does that reluctantly at first, and then God says to use Aaron. Aaron will be your voice. You'll be a God to um, Aaron, and Aaron will be like a prophet. And together, both of you are going to convince the Israelites that I spoke to them. And then from there, you're going to approach Pharaoh and get, get him to release all the people. And we know what happens. Uh, he doesn't want to do it. Ten plagues. Basically, they, they do end up leaving, but they end up spoiling all of Egypt because basically people had favor they're basically here whatever we have here you take it because just just get out of here get out of egypt so they ended up spoiling egypt and that's how they had gold silver all this kind of stuff and they're able to make the ark they were able to make the tabernacle in the wilderness all this kind of stuff because of all the stuff that they had collected from the egyptians and an interesting note is some of the Egyptians actually decided to leave with Israel. They didn't want to stay behind anymore. I don't blame them. Uh, everything was destroyed um, right down to their firstborn uh, were killed off. So there wasn't very much left of the army because the army ended up dying in the Red Sea. They all drowned. So probably Egypt was in a, was in a bad place. And what's interesting is historically... You, if you were to match up the timeline, you could see that the Bronze Age, that was about the time of the collapse of the Bronze Age. Some people say, well, that was just a coincidence. Yeah, it seems like that, that would make sense, that that would be the time that the Bronze Age collapsed is when the Israelites left Egypt after all the plagues. Just a thought. So then we get introduced to the Ten Commandments. In Exodus, Leviticus, we dive a little bit deeper. All the roles of the Levites, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to sacrifice animals, all this stuff. And really at the very beginning, when Israel 
left Egypt, there was really only one command, and that was to obey and to hear God's voice, really. That was it. There was no sacrifices. There was no killing of bulls, no killing of sheep, nothing like that. There was, God made it so easy. He just said, you know what? Hear my voice and obey it. That's all I want from you guys. That's it. And eventually got to a point where they didn't want to hear God's voice from the mountain when God was inviting them up to the mountain and God was prepping the people to come to him. They said, no, no, Moses, you talk to God for us and whatever he says we'll do. And then that's when the sacrificial um, ordinances came about was after that. It wasn't before. So the only thing, the only commandment really was just to obey God's voice. It's pretty simple. And this is where we're at today as a Christian. We're to listen to the Holy Spirit and obey his voice, especially when he's teaching us the word of God. And he's teaching us about God's son, Jesus Christ. So we've come full circle, especially as a Christian. It's kind of interesting. I love the book of Leviticus. He's like... I think there's like 27 chapters, I believe. Yeah, 27 chapters basically talks about uh, religious duties. It talks about basically, you, you could basically look at the book of Leviticus almost like uh, how to have a relationship with each other, with God, uh, how to take care of each other's needs if people get sick if they have ailments, all this kind of stuff, and then also how to take care of themselves financially as well. It's almost like you, you have the tabernacle that is like a hospital, it's like a church, and it's also like a bank as well. No wonder the Jews are very good at making money. They have the book of Leviticus. Good book to study. All right, we're jumping into numbers. Now, numbers, I'll admit, for a little while... It took me a bit to get used to reading numbers because, man, I tell you, there's so many, there's so much data going on in the book of Numbers that you can get sleepy if you're not careful. And for some reason, I'm able to get through it, not to say that I'm smart, but it's because I'm used to the wording, the terminology, the names of the priest, the numbers, all this kind of stuff. And the more times you read, the book of Numbers, the less daunting is it's going to be on you, the less sleepy it will make you. I promise you. You just have to keep pressing in and reading it. And now I can actually read the book of Numbers without getting sleepy. In fact, I can read the whole Bible. There's, there's, I can't think of any books right now that, that make me sleepy. I used to fall asleep after 10, 15 minutes of reading the Bible. Now I can just plow through it. Like I've been reading the Bible pretty much all since I got home from work. Uh, reading through, finished the book of Isaiah today. It took me about three days to read it. And then now I'm on the book of Jeremiah. I've also been reading the book of Nehemiah over and over again. That takes about 40, 45 minutes to read the entire book of Nehemiah. I've been reading it every day. So just there's just lots of gold nuggets. Uh, especially for a devotion, a daily devotion. Uh, but yeah, Numbers is great because I like the idea behind it because God keeps track of everything, keeps track of everything. And now we have a, uh, a, a newborn child that's coming into this world. My grandson could be minutes away, could be hours away, could be tomorrow morning, whatever, but this child is coming. And God already knew what the child's name was. Uh, he has a purpose for this child and everything. And I'm so excited. I can't wait to meet this boy. It's going to be fun. So that's why I like numbers. Keeps track of everything. We see Israel getting into trouble because um, uh, we get introduced to Balaam and his donkey. Crazy Balaam. Psycho Balaam. Basically tries to put curses on Israel. And pretty much that basically haunted Israel for hundreds of years after that because of that one incident where Balaam was trying to pronounce curses on Israel. He ended up, God ended up flipping it and turning it into a blessing. Uh, but 
Israel lost a lot of people because of that. And a lot of men turned away to foreign wives, worshiping other gods, and they never really could get rid of that. So that's numbers. Let's just go into Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is one of my favorite books. Uh, I used to pretty much try and read Deuteronomy every every Saturday. And uh, it's just a heavy book. It's There's so much in it. It's basically Moses at the latter end of his life. He's basically God is saying like, Moses, you're going to die now. You're 120 years old. Um, these are your final thoughts. So Moses recaps everything that had happened to them, all the promises, and gets the people to enter into a curse, basically saying, like, if you agree to follow all these things, you're going to be blessed. But if you don't follow everything that, that is prescribed here in these, within these five books, if you will, um, then it's not going to go well for you. And especially if you enter into a covenant with God and you say, I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm not going to follow any other gods. And you turn around and you follow other gods. Well, in Deuteronomy, God said that he will pluck these people out and cast them all over the world. And that's what he ends up doing after um, the fall of Israel and after the fall of Judah. Basically, they get carried away into captivity. And Moses is saying, the second I die, you guys are going to fall away. Basically, it's prophetic. It's quite interesting. That's what ends up happening with Israel. Then we get into Joshua, which I think is probably one of the most perfect books in the Bible. Not that the other ones aren't perfect. But if you look at it from a, a, a person's perspective, Joshua whose name basically, if you're to translate it, means Jesus. But Joshua is a Hebrew name. Um, it's 24 chapters. Basically, Joshua did everything by the book. He did everything right. And at the end of Joshua, we see Israel getting the land, even though they didn't kick out everybody. But they destroyed a lot of the kings, a lot of the... The guys that were in power, I think there was like 31 kings that they ended up destroying. And they made peace with with, with any, any nation that God did not want to destroy because of the corruption that they had. And a lot of people misunderstand this. They, they look at this as going, well, God is pretty harsh by wiping out some of these nations. But he gave them hundreds, if not thousands of years to turn around. And the ones that did repent ended up assimilating into Israel, which is quite interesting. Uh, we could look at the story of Ruth, where basically she was a Moabite, and she ended up being the great-grandmother of King David, which is fascinating. So anyways, Joshua, 24 chapters. Awesome, awesome book. Then we get into Judges. Judges is kind of... I want to say it's kind of depressing. It's not depressing. That's not the right word. But Judges gets dark pretty quick because they fall away right away. They just finished inheriting all the land. And then Judah is the first one to go and continue and conquer and all this kind of stuff. But they just keep messing up. As soon as things get rough, they just, or as soon as things get good, they fall away. They just fall away, and then God has to introduce a savior, which is another word for a judge, to save Israel. One person at a time. So whether that's Samson, whether that's um, Gideon, Deborah, Barak, all these guys, all these people. Like it's it's actually it's actually it's it's action packed. But there's a lot of darkness in it as well because it's sad because they are now in the promised land and they're falling away. Very sad. Uh, and then, of course, Samson kind of wrapping things up by basically um, being with Delilah and she wants to know the secret to his strength and ends up, um, basically, he ends up getting his eyes plucked out grinding in the in the mill um, i think that's some kind of a sexual 
term. If you study the Old Testament, you, you quickly realize when they're talking about uncovering the feet and all this kind of stuff, that's almost like uh, a sexual term in some, in some instances. So with Samson, I believe what they're getting him to do, whether that's having sex with prostitutes, whatever it is, making fun of him, all this kind of stuff to get some of his DNA, if you will, to have children with other people, whatever it is. Uh, but the guy was blind and he was used for only one reason, and that was to grind with the Philistines. This is not just grinding grain and all this kind of stuff. Anyways, so uh, he ends up being naked between two pillars and he asks the, the boy to uh, help him put his hands on the pillars and then he asks God for one act of revenge that he could basically bring down the whole temple uh, to avenge the loss of his eyes. And he ended up killing more people in that one feat than he did in his entire life. Kind of interesting. Then we get to Ruth, which we get introduced to um, how you can actually be redeemed if you don't have any relatives that are left, especially from the male side of things. Maybe you lost your inheritance or whatever. You need some family member that can help you redeem your land back. So redemption right here. This is Redemption 101 in the book of Ruth. Love it. Takes you like 10 minutes to read the book of Ruth. Then we get into Samuel. Originally, this was basically like um, four books of kings, if you will. And gradually throughout time, they decided to divide these four books of kings and make them into two books of Samuel. Uh, it was actually one book of Samuel, one book of kings, but then they, they split it up. Two books of Samuel, two books of kings. Like I said at the beginning, it was like four books of kings. So, um, basic understanding is Samuel was written by Samuel. Obviously, he dies at the end of 1 Samuel. And then someone had to take over and write 2 Samuel. And I forget who it was that wrote it. One of the priests that took over um, after, I think it was one of the sons of Eli. Maybe. Grandsons. One of the Levites, anyway. All right, so I don't think it was Ezra. Don't think so. Anyways, we'll continue on. So that's first. First, I'm going to get an introduction to the very first king. Then we jump into, uh, we, we, we get an introduction also to King David. And that's basically what First Samuel is all about. And then Second Samuel is basically the life of David, which is very cool. King Saul is has died so so of his sons three of three of his four sons have died and uh, yeah it's kind of interesting that there's one guy that was at the place where King Saul died and brought his crown to King David and King David said how did you know that this what happened to Saul and he said I just happened upon him and he said uh, run me through because uh, he fell on his own sword and didn't die so this guy ended up killing him and then bringing his crown and David said based on your own words um, you're gonna die for that you should have known better not to touch the king the anointed one and had one of his men kill um, whoever that guy was forget his name anyways interesting story there so then we get to the part where Satan basically tempts King David to number all of Israel, uh, even against Joab's wishes, because I think it was a power play where King David was like, now that I have conquered all these nations around me, I would like to know my power, my strength. And that was a no-no. So God had him make three basically three wishes if you will you could have um you could be removed for three years so you can have um i think it was three years of famine three months of famine something like that 
or three days of pestilence, which is basically an angel, a destroying angel going through Israel and was almost going to destroy all of Jerusalem, which is kind of interesting. But God said, no, that's enough. I think 85,000 people died. Interesting. So that's, that's the second Samuel. And then at the end of second Samuel, King David is getting old, has all kinds of battles. And in first Kings, we get introduced to King Solomon. That's what first Kings is all about. All the way up until basically, yeah, first Kings basically talks about the splitting of um, the nation of Israel into Israel and into Judah. So Judah has Benjamin. Benjamin and Judah is basically one tribe and one nation, I should say, with the Levites as well. And then the northern, the, then you have the 10 northern tribes that get split and they do their own thing. They fall away from God. They basically, uh, the first king, um, Jeroboam, created uh, two calves, one in the south in Bethel, one in the north in Dan, around the, around the area of Dan. And basically, he just said, this is your God. This is your God that brought you out of Egypt, all this kind of stuff. Worship, he didn't want them going to the temple to worship. Instead, he wanted them to stay in Israel, the northern part of Israel. That was a no-no. So after that, basically, they all, well, basically all their kings were evil. And with Judah, which follows the lineage of David, some were good, some were bad. Then we get into 2 Kings, where we start getting introduced to some of the prophets, Elijah, Isaiah, all this kind of stuff. And this takes us all the way to the last king. Uh, Hezekiah, basically, not Hezekiah, he's the last king. Last king gets carried away and gets his eyes poked out. Very similar to what happened to Samson, um, Zedekiah. So basically, he ends up getting killed. He ends up seeing his sons killed in front of him, and then he gets his eyes poked out. Very sad, very sad. They get carried away. Chronicles is a retelling of the whole thing all the way back to Abraham. Basically, it's just a snapshot of what had happened. And I would say this would be more from a perspective of um, the good kings, if you will. And they kind of lightly go over, and I think this was written by Ezra, I believe. Um, Chronicles kind of goes lightly over any of the wicked things that the, the kings did from Judah. Like, they don't really dive into what Solomon did, all his wickedness. Instead, they kind of hint that he was a good king, and that's it. And they just kind of move on to the other kings. That's, that's Chronicles, First Chronicles, basically a lot of history. And then it finishes off with a bang in Second Chronicles... Because it starts getting into actually King Solomon's reign, how he designed uh, the temple, all this kind of stuff. And then we get into um, the carrying away again into Babylon. And then at the end of Chronicles, we get uh, King Cyrus saying, hey, if you guys want to go back, because basically he ran all the provinces. I think there's like 120 provinces. I could be wrong. But basically saying, like, if you guys want to go back, we own this area anyway. We, we, we run, we have governors in Israel right now. So if you want, if there's anybody that wants to go back and rebuild the temple, you can do this because what was happening was um, there were animals that were, were devouring people and all kinds of stuff. And there was curses and all kinds of things that, that the the Babylonian Empire did not want to deal with. They didn't want any gods mad at them. So they said, you know what, if we can send some people to teach the ways of God, then maybe we won't get into trouble. So that's part of the reason why they sent them back. Also, uh, it became prophetic, uh, a prophecy that was fulfilled when Jeremiah said after 70 years, they're going to come back. That's Chronicles. Chronicles is a heavy book. And then we get into Ezra, 
Ezra is responsible for um, helping rebuild the temple, getting that all together, and and organizing people. And basically, he had all the uh, the genealogies, if you will, of people to be able to figure out who who can help out with the temple and restoring it, and all this kind of stuff. And that took over. I think it was a period of like 15 years or something like that. Later, he gets help from Nehemiah. Nehemiah helps build the wall. So that's Ezra and Nehemiah now. Nehemiah helps build the wall, obviously, uh, with all the gates. You got the, uh, what's the first gate? The first gate is the sheep gate, and then you got the fish gate, and then you got the valley gate, and you got the fountain, and you got all, all the gates that uh, Nehemiah is helping rebuild. And then once they're done that, then he gets Ezra to help out by reading the Torah, basically six hours at a time, going through the whole Torah with 13 other individuals. And they basically just take their time and read the Torah and say, do you understand this? And they want, want people to understand because a lot of people didn't speak Hebrew they were basically, they spoke of the Babylonian language, if you will. And um, that was hinted at because they were mixing up their families by marrying women that were strangers, that, that worshipped other gods and stuff. And Nehemiah has to deal with this. So does Ezra. A lot of people lost their heritage because their marriages were so mixed. And then he cleans, cleans house. Um, even at the end, basically, throughout Nehemiah, he's always saying, remember me for what I'm doing. Remember me, remember me. And at the end, basically, uh, there's one incident, one funny story where there's people that he kicks out of Jerusalem because they're bringing in all of their goods, their fish and everything, and they're trying to sell stuff on the Sabbath. And he kicks them all out, shuts the gates, and he sees them basically standing around outside of Jerusalem. He says, if you come in here, I'm going to lay my hands on you. I'm going to beat the tar out of you if you come here on the Sabbath. So he put a stop to that. That's Nehemiah. And then we get into Esther, which is interesting. Um, Esther ends up uh, becoming queen. And they, they actually are in the same palace, the Shushan Palace. That's the same palace where Daniel lived. That's the same palace where um, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to Artaxerxes, which I believe is the stepson of Esther, I believe. So Esther is actually before Nehemiah, I believe. Then we get into Job. Job is a fascinating book. It's considered, many consider the book of Job the oldest book in the Bible. I'm not going to dive too much into it, but I love I love Job. I love what happens. Um, not what happens to him. That sounds morbid. But I like how bad things happen to Job. And then he has three friends that come and comfort him. And at the end of Job, it's kind of interesting. There's this one guy that's listening to these three guys giving advice to Job. And they're like, guys, you're, you're kind of missing the big picture here. That Job ha actually has some pride. And you're not even talking about it. And then God basically rebukes these three guys, but God does not rebuke this one guy, this young lad. He doesn't say anything bad about him. He says, look, you guys are all in error. And you know what? At the end of all this stuff, after he reveals himself to Job, he says to these three guys, go to Job. Job's going to pray for you because of what you had done wasn't right. So that's how Job ends. Then we get into Psalms. Psalms is a great book. Uh, 150 chapters. Um, trying to think where I think Paul talks about that. I'm trying to think which I think it's in Corinthians. Not 100 percent sure, but he says that we should basically be singing psalms every day. And this is something I got to get better at: is memorizing some of the psalms and using it for worship and being able to just worship God through the Book of Psalms because they're very prophetic. King David wrote it. Asaph wrote it, wrote Psalms, Solomon wrote Psalms, so it's very important. Then we get into Proverbs. Proverbs is kind of cool because you can read the chapter a day and get through Proverbs. 
And then we got, uh, what's the next one? The Song of Solomon. That's an interesting book. I have a theory around that. Part of me thinks this could be uh, King Solomon when he was going a little bit cray cray at the end of his life, wrote Song of Solomon, and it almost feels like we're talking about the Garden of Eden. Uh, maybe it's the devil and Eve. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Just a kind of a little theory that I have. A lot of people don't know who this book is addressed to. Some people say, oh, it's it's Jesus Christ and the church. Oh, it's 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 God and Israel and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Then we get into Isaiah, heavy hitter, 66 books or 66 chapters, which is a coincidence that we have 66 books of the Bible. Um, it starts off pretty heavy, pretty dark, uh, but finishes off with a bang. Love Isaiah. Then we get into Jeremiah. There's actually a movie about Jeremiah too. I forget who the actor was in it, uh, but it's actually a good movie. Jeremiah, I would strongly encourage it. It's on YouTube. You can watch the movie Jeremiah. Pretty accurate. I like it. Uh, so yeah, basically a lot of stuff happens to Jeremiah. A lot of a lot of bad things ends up in prison uh, because all the prophets were saying that we're going to be peaceful, we're going to be victorious, all this kind of stuff. And Jeremiah is trying to tell them that no, no, no. Listen, what's going to happen is these guys are going to carry you away, and you're to go with them. Go with them. Don't fight it. And they ended up throwing him in prison. He almost died a few times. Uh, and then we get to, what's after that? Ezekiel. Get into Ezekiel. Lots of visions. Oh, Lamentations. Lamentations happens basically right after the cap, the captivity. Uh, basically, Jeremiah is writing what he sees. He sees all the walls torn down, the temple destroyed, all this kind of stuff. And it's just horrible. Horrible. Then we get to Ezekiel, talks a lot about futuristic things, what's going to happen with uh, uh, Moab, the Ammonites, the Edomites, because those, those groups of people basically, when Israel was captured by Babylon, Babylon, there were a lot of people that escaped, not a lot, some escaped, and they ran to Edom for help, to Eden, Edom for help, which is... Uh, Esau and all of his relatives and basically they they captured them and took them to Babylon for money and when no one was in Jerusalem they would actually go and raid people's homes and all this kind of stuff same thing with the Moabites they would basically capture them and take them to prison uh, for profit and when they were down and out God said, you know what, I'm going to punish you guys for doing that. So this is why we have to be careful about speaking bad about Israel because you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Israel is a blessed nation. They are to be a light to the world. And God has big plans for the nation of Israel. Then after Ezekiel, we get into Daniel. Daniel's kind of cool, obviously, because we get introduced to uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as well. Fascinating study. They get tossed into a fiery furnace for not bowing down to an image. And Daniel gets tossed into the lion's den. And the lions didn't touch him. So he ends up being promoted. Same thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're basically 10 times smarter than anyone else when it comes to astrology probably biology anything science the science of their day these guys were smarter than everyone else then we get into i believe it's joe hosea is it hosea that doesn't sound right daniel yeah hosea we get into the minor prophets book of hosea then we get into amos micah zephaniah those are all short books. They shouldn't take you too long to read. Then you get into Zechariah. Zechariah, for a while, what, to me, was the most complicated book in the Bible. Zechariah. Like, I, I, I'd read it over and over and over again. I'm like, man, what, what's going on here with this priest Joshua in heaven? And you got Satan standing there accusing him and stuff. And then it looks like 
it feels like that God is giving him a new garment that was almost like skin, if you will, almost like he's creating a body for Jesus to come to earth and Satan was opposing it. It's kind of interesting. Anyways, that's Zechariah. Then we've got Malachi talking about all the bad things that's going to happen and then ends off with uh, basically remembering the law of Moses. Then we get into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I always encourage people, if you're reading a book of the Bible, finish the book before you jump into something else. I know that's not always possible because Isaiah took me like three days to read. It's a heavy hitter. But Matthew you can do it in a couple of hours. Mark takes you about 40 minutes. Luke, a couple of hours. John, a couple of hours. And you're done. The Gospels. Then you get into Acts. Like I read, I can't tell you how many times I've read the book of Acts in the last year. It's just, it's, it's basically how we got our church. Is really the history of how we, how we became Christians, all this kind of stuff. The revelation that God gave or that Jesus Christ gave to Paul and uh, it's just kind of interesting seeing everything basically the transition from Peter to Paul because Peter was to the circumcised Paul was to the uncircumcised so that's kind of cool and then of course you get into Romans which is obviously one of my favorite books of the Bible this started me on this whole journey as I read the book of Romans every day for 30 days. It took me about, the first time I read Romans took me a couple of hours. Then I got it down to where I could read the book of Romans like 30 minutes flat, flat. Um, but yeah, it's an awesome book. I would suggest a new Christian, if they're gonna read, I would say I would start them off in Romans and, and read all of the Pauline epistles, leave, uh, the book of Revelation to the very end. I would read the Pauline epistles. Then I would probably read the four gospels. And then I would jump into Genesis. And then just start from there. That, that would be my my way of uh, thinking. I know a lot of people say start off in Luke. Go to Acts. But I think Romans is good. Because it gives us a good foundation of who we are in Christ. And once you realize who we are in Christ. The whole Bible opens up to you. You start loving people and you're just loving his word. You want to know Christ more, all this kind of stuff. Then we get to Corinthians. Corinthians is one of my favorite books. Love, love Corinthians because there's so much golden nuggets in there talking about the, uh, the rapture, all kinds of stuff, how we're supposed to live our lives as Christians. And it talks about how to admonish brothers that fall away. Uh, if they're practicing sin, whatever, how you're supposed to do it in love so that they can repent and come back into the church, all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of interesting. I like it. Then we get, uh, what are we in? Galatians. Galatians is great because it's a little bit more of Paul's testimony as to how he got saved and <clears throat> basically shares the revelation of the gospel of Christ that was revealed to him by Jesus Christ, not by man. He didn't learn it by man. Nobody taught it to him. It was revealed to him by Jesus Christ, which is kind of cool. And it lines up with the Old Testament, which is neat. Plus, as a bonus, Paul teaches us stuff that is unsearchable in the Old Testament. So it lines up with the Old Testament, but there's also nuggets in there that you cannot find in the Old Testament about Jesus Christ. This is why it's confusing to some Jews. They're like, oh, I, I don't see it or whatever. Well, once you become a Christian, that veil comes off and then you start studying the Pauline epistles, then the rest of the scriptures open up to you as well, especially because once you see who you are in Christ, everything just opens up. Then we get into Ephesians. Another one of my favorite books, basically talking about who we are uh, in Christ and our vocation in heaven, because this is what we're being prepped for, for heaven, because after we die, we are with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul goes deep, deep. A lot of people think, well, when we die, that's it, that's it. But it's not it, that's just the beginning. 
Um, what's going to happen here, we're going to forget the things that happened to us here on Earth a billion years from now. We're not even going to remember some of the stuff that we're dealing with finances, whatever it is, it'll just be like, oh yeah, I remember that. That was like 500,000 years ago. You're not going to remember it. You're not going to remember it. Get into Philippians, Colossians, short book, but heavy, a heavy hitter as well. So much in Colossians. Uh, talking about basically seeking things which are above. Then we get into Thessalonians again, a little hint at the rapture, how it works. Um, because there was a rumor that people were writing letters pretending that they were Paul saying that the rapture already happened and or that the, the day of the Lord had already happened and Paul's like, no, no, it's not going to happen until the Antichrist comes and when he's revealed, then you could start to clock as to when the Lord comes back and say, but for us Christians, we don't worry about that because when we die, we're instantly in heaven. So this is what First and Second Thessalonians is talking about, being faithful to Christ. Then you get to Timothy, because Paul's now winding down. He's basically saying, like, I've done everything by the book. I've, I've done everything I could, and here's how you are to live your life, young Timothy. And uh, then we get to Titus. Basically, he's wrapping up things with all of his leaders, Titus. And then also a letter to Philemon, basically saying, you know, this guy that, that you had as a slave or whatever, um, this guy's been valuable to me. So I would say take him back, not as a slave, but as a friend, as a brother, because he's helped me out so much. Um, I think he should take him back. Hebrews, um, lot, there's a lot of debate on who wrote Hebrews. I, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews you could build an argument um, whether or not Timothy or Barnabas wrote it because it kind of has a little bit of a Levite slant to it if you will it talks about um, Melchizedek and all this kind of stuff and Jesus being in that lineage so it's this is a deep book as well then you get into uh, Peter James John those are quick reads as well, heavy. And then you got Jude, and then the book of Revelation. Like I say, I would leave the book of Revelation to the end. Lots of symbolism there, but the most important thing for you to know is we win in the end. There you go. The whole Bible is covered through the whole Bible in one sitting. How about that? Amazing, isn't it? Anyways, hope you got something out of it. I am tired. <laughs> It's late at night. It's probably, it's, I think it's like almost midnight. Anyways, uh, hope you got something out of that and I'll see you in another video. Bye for now.